Well, welcome everyone, and a very big welcome to our special guest tonight, Anne Shelton. Um, it's really fantastic to have you here. My name's Victoria Munro, and my pronouns are she, her. I'm the executive director of the Alice Austin House, which, uh, if you've never been, is a historic house located on the north shore of Staten Island's waterfront and of course is named for its most famous uh, resident, Alice Austin, who was a photographic artist, a lesbian woman who was born in 1866 and left us a phenomenal archive of close to 8,000 images of a changing New York City, her world travels and her amazing friends. Alice is the one smiling. Um, and there, well, that's two smiling. Alice is standing and smiling with her two friends, uh, Julia and Julia, taken in 1891 uh, in the gardens of the Alice Austin house. Uh, Austin uh, really treated her home as a studio. The garden became an outdoor studio for her. She's really remarkable. Um, because of um, her ability to work outside of the studio, which was extremely rare at the time for a woman. Um, so she is a real trailblazer um, of, uh, you know, photographic practice on the streets of New York. And uh, like I said, her travels, uh, which she had extensive uh, experience traveling to Europe, but also upstate and these wonderful meeting places for her and her uh, woman friends. Austin was deeply connected to nature and was the founding member of the Staten Island Garden Club. And the Alice Austin House is located in 15 acres of New York City parkland. Um, so, we're really a living, breathing photographic museum dedicated to the life and work of, uh, of Alice Austin. And we work with artists that have really interesting connections to her work, her life and her practice. So today we're going to be talking to Anne Shelton, who is a New Zealand artist. So you might notice a similarity in our accents. I am originally from New Zealand, but 25 years a resident of New York City. And I have known Anne for many more, more years than my 25 here in New York because her photographic practice is really what connected us and also the Auckland City art scene in New Zealand. Um, so Anne's had a multiple decades long photographic practice and her work is really, really interesting because it is super based in research. And that's something that we're so interested in at the Alice Austin House, Austin herself being so under-researched and her history being really precarious. Um, Anne's work delves into um, various elements of women's histories that are in that same kind of hanging in the balance position that have often not been interpreted, not been revisited, um, and really shines a new light on them, celebrates them as we do with Austin's work, um, and also becomes quite multidisciplinary because of the way the research uh, informs the photographs. There's uh, often collaborations with uh, performative uh, elements to exhibitions and also um, the creation of book projects and creative writing as well. So I know that Anne can speak to this so much better than I can, but these are some of the elements that absolutely keep me so fascinated um, by Anne's work. And I'm just so excited that uh, Anne will be presenting uh, an exhibition, a solo exhibition with us at the Alice Austin House in the spring of 2024. And right now has an exhibition at Denny Dimon Gallery in New York City. What we're going to do tonight is share a slideshow and Anne's going to speak to her work and I'm going to ask her some questions along the way. I also invite you 
to ask questions in the chat um, as they come up for you. And I will make sure that I leave a window of around about 15 minutes at the end of the hour uh, for you to turn on your microphone, participate. We really like having these kind of talks um, to feel very connected to, to our um, participants that are actively listening. Of course, we're obviously recording this so that you can share this with your friends at a later date. And the Alice Austin House can share out as well as uh, a part of an archive of this process of collaboration with Anne and the museum. So thank you so much for being here, Anne. Can you tell us where you're calling in from? Kia ora. Nā mihi nui ki a koutou katoa. Warm greetings to you all. I'm coming to you from Auckland City, uh, Tamaki Makoro, uh, and I'm here actually staying at a friend's house today um, because I'm up in Auckland for the art fair and another opening that I had last night. So thank you so much for having me um, online to speak, Victoria, and I'm super excited about having an exhibition at Alice Austin House and just day by day the you know the connections between um, Alice's practice and and the museum and the and the resonances you know are becoming kind of clearer and clearer and I love this idea of the studio garden and of the ha of Alice's house as as an extended kind of studio and I think you know in my home I feel very much the same way about it. Um, what I'm going to do is share your slide deck and, and we're going to start with the very new work, uh, which is currently on display uh, in New York City, um, as I said, at Danny Dimon Gallery. And um, I'd like, I'd love it for you um, to talk to um, uh, uh, to the photographs uh, about the, the sort of materials that you've used um for these still lives and, and and how they resonate and you can guide me to change the slides and um we have a pretty dense slide deck tonight so we'll see how much we get through the most important thing is really hearing some more about these incredible works so i'm going to share my screen now Okay, so this is the title for the new body of work. I am an old phenomenon. And do you want to talk a little bit about that title for us? Yeah, I guess for me, it's you know, it, it, it's such a a kind of connector, and, and it's it's present, but it also reaches back historically, um, which of course is exactly how I feel about the figure of the witch who's the linchpin for this project. She's really the figure around which uh, the images kind of circulate. Um, yeah. So I'm gonna scroll through a little bit so that everyone can get a feel for the images and in, in, in this body of work and have a real understanding about just the clarity of these works and the composition, um, your color choices, so many things but what's obviously incredibly important is what you're what the materials that you're using to create uh these works yeah so i've had to become a bit of a gardener um sometimes uh the plants are more ready, readily available than others um some of the plants i've been able to purchase commercially but a lot I haven't, so I've had to grow them. And it, sometimes it will take me three years to kind of grow enough of a plant to, to have and use for an, to make an image. Also, I think a big part of my practice has become foraging. So, you know, I'm often out cycling and um, I'll, you know, I'll pick up materials um, on those rides and, and just, you know, people will find things for me because they know the work that I'm doing. And, I guess as I become more and more familiar with plants, because I'm not a botanist, um, I, you know, I'm kind of um, more able to spot things that I need, etc. So um, the Brugmansia, which was in the first image, um, was, you know, from a friend's garden. Um, 
the fungi that you can see there and that image was actually growing in the kind of forest garden at the back of my house so yeah more and more I'm trying to you know find and grow things rather than purchase them um and obviously the plants the plants are part of uh, a kind of lexicon if you like or a, a, a kind of a grouping of plants that were used in uh, used by wise women or wart cunners or witches, um, what you might call a green witch or a kitchen witch in a more contemporary sense um, for the purposes of healing and for magical rituals. And so I became really interested in these plants um, and started researching them as a result of my last body of work, which was called Jane Says, which we've got some slides of um, in the PowerPoint that we could probably flick through to, if you want to have a look. That was also exhibited at 20, in, in 2019 at Denny Dimon. Uh, and it looks at the histories of plants that are associated with what you might call women's herbs. So they're herbs that are either amenagogues or abortifacients. So they'll either bring on menstruation or the cause an abortion or they're also used in all kinds of ways to do things like cleanse the womb and um, uh, for um, you know menstrual pain and things like endometriosis and also uh, midwives would have used these herbs a lot um, in working with women when they were having children and um, so yeah, I got I got I was really interested in that grouping of plants. And then that of course led me to the figure of the witch, who was the keeper of that knowledge around reproduction and, and birth control. And um and also obviously she was seen as highly problematic because she held that knowledge and and um and in order to take that away from her, of course, we have a phenomenon like the witch hunts. So I, I became really interested in her and that's where this body of work grew out of. I think it's really interesting, you know, when I was talking just in the beginning, um, when I read some of your writing about this work, where you uh, talk about a re-examining of um, these uh, practices, um, this woman's knowledge, that was so you know important um and and how um misinterpreted maligned persecuted you know all of these various things um that uh you know are really i think you know people are really ready for them to be re-examined and given uh voice to um and so you know these materials that the these specific plants that you choose um each uh image almost has its own series of history to it because of the meanings of each of these things like you were saying about foraging the roots and such how yeah. much does um a plant's form when you decide to work with it inform your composition like how does it inform the way the end of the pho the photograph's going to look? Because you're doing playing with, um, you know, you're you're really constructing these scenes with these plants, and some yeah. of them also interact with pottery and vases and vessels. Yeah, I think the plant, you know, in, in some ways the plant is dictating, you know, how it's going to be seen. I mean, some plants like morning glory which I photographed you know there's just I basically you know ran up the hill cut a piece of morning glory and ran back down the hill to my studio you know hung the plant up and took the photo and after 10 shots the the plant was dead so or wilted or no longer you know suitable for being photographed so in some instances like that and also with the Bragmansia the the first image you showed plants are incredibly fragile and you know they 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 dictate that you know you have to move very quickly others I've built these almost sort of sculpture plants sculptures um and I'm thinking about you know little shrines or kind of sites of 
remembrance or worship or and you know they're constructed of things like stone and moss and pine needles and um ferns and um all sorts of bits of wood and I've got this kind of wonder karma that I'm kind of uh where that in my garage where I collect and um store plant materials to use and so they are they're kind of a different approach formally and compositionally um there's sort of three re registers in the work really in this new series I'm an old phenomenon there's the sort of watery or underwater images and there's the um, very grounded earth images which have a horizon line and I'm intending for to refer the viewer to the idea of a bench perhaps a witch's workbench or a, an architectural feature like a windowsill and a lot of uh, spell recipes um, you know a plant will be placed on the windowsill or you know in a particular place in relation to architecture so I was sort of thinking about that and with this work I'm obviously trying to reconnect us back to the earth and and to and so I you know I've been thinking all the way through about grounding the photographs and you know that's why there's dirt and there's um, rocks and uh, and the palette also refers to that conceptually you know the sort of dark wet forest green and you know deep I'm going to scroll back to some of those works really yeah. quickly. Yeah, deep, that deep, you deep. can see that. Yeah, um, or the kind of earthy tone of the sort of cinnamon background works. So that's one of my little sculpture things. The ap the apple actually was really hard to photograph. If you want to go back to that for a minute, Victoria, please. Um, you know, and that in many ways that kind of dictated how it would be photographed as well because I kind of wanted to deal with the sort of branches somehow um, and put them into some kind of form that didn't use a vessel, you know, but um, but still, you know, had some kind of shape. And I guess I'm, you know, I'm trying to refer to natural forms in the in the compositional elements of the work as well, I guess. You know, I think that um, connecting these works and hanging these works in the Alice Austin house is going to be a really interesting experience. It's already really interesting. Uh, uh, and just recently visited the site and was able to get that. It, it's, there's nothing like being at the historic house physically. And so some of these works will be hanging in a room that was built in 1690. So you are it's one of the oldest homes in New York City um and it's just um filled with the house is filled with all of this energy um which I think is a, a really interesting concept in itself in terms of placing this work here and and this is evolving of course um and you're also, um, as I was scrolling through, we did briefly uh, touch on a poster work that is a part of your new exhibition, the first iteration, if you like, of I Am An Old Phenomenon. I'll quickly go to that. So, and it includes this um, incredible image. And on the back side of the poster, um, could you talk about what this writing is and and is it your writing um how how do you how, how has this come about and and then we'll feed into talking a little bit about the book works yeah so the I guess this the whole thing I guess for the for me the figure of the witch is you know she's this really interesting figure because she holds this tangible knowledge about plants this you know incredible depth of knowledge and understanding and a kind of embodied relationship with plants that you know in our contemporary society in the west we have lost um, but she's also the stuff of you know bedtime stories and um, flight and magic and um, she's so she inhabits this sort of uh, I guess space of 
fact and fiction somehow. And so I was, you know, and a lot that has been a, a long term interest in my practice is, is looking at how sometimes, you know, fact and fiction are conflated. Uh, and so I wanted that to somehow be um, present in the exhibition. And so I started thinking about text as a way to um, to achieve that. And I commissioned um, Pip Adam, who's an amazing New Zealand uh, novelist, to write a story. And Pip and I, how we work together is we, we've worked together before. Um, we'll sort of meet up and talk about the key concepts for the show and in this instance, you know, I talked a lot about water and the figure of the witch and also wanting to kind of um, convey this sense of the, the, the resonances of the witch as story, but also as holder of all this tangible knowledge. And so we came up with the idea that the story would slip into um, quotes from my research at certain points. So you can see the bolded sections on the, on the screen uh, from my research. I, I really, um, I'm interested in, I seem to be a bit obsessed with quotations, you know. I love quotography. I love assembl assembling quotes together from the research that I do and, um, and finding ways to manifest those in the practice. And last time I had a show at Denny Dimon in 2019, I did another poster, which was a, a sort of, curated quotography of of all my research but this time I, I decided for the reasons I was just discussing that it was really relevant to have a story on the poster um, to kind of inflect this idea of this you know this how the witch circulates in our popular conscience and cinema and in, in um, and in books um, so yeah so we worked together and Pip came up with a story that's uh, in three acts and it's about three witches. Um, and yeah, they, uh, they're kind of in different scenes. One of them's in a restaurant serving fly agaric and one of them's on a boat um, sort of slightly drugging the, um, <laughs> the more cantankerous client, clientele to calm them down, <laughs> make them more manageable. And the other one, uh, the third one is, uh, an, I think, an air, on an air, in an aircraft of some sort. So, yeah, they kind of come together to a, a, in, in the end, um, but I won't give the story away. Yeah. I've lost you. Uh, You've got me back. You can um, access this, but they have copies at Denny Dimon right now. We have copies at the Alice Austin House, um, which yes. we will continue to have available right through until Anne's exhibition. Um, there's a larger uh, project with writing and images um, that will be created for the 2024 exhibition. Could you speak to the structure of that or how you envisage that, um, what that being? I'm still thinking through through that, but I'm really, um, I'm interested in trying to create, uh, this idea of a quotography is becoming more and more important. Um, so I'm interested in, I'm sort of assembling, as I photograph each plant, you know, I'm assembling these quotes, which, to me articulate the sort of depth and resonance of the plants that you were talking about at the beginning of the, the discussion. Um, you know, because obviously the meanings of the plants change across time and, and, and across cultures and they have so many different names, for example, which is why the titles of the work include all the folk names. If you wanna to go to one of the titles, we can. Um... Yeah, do you want me to go to one of the titles from I Am An Old Phenomenon? Yeah. That would be awesome, yeah. So um, Ginger's only got one name, so it's not a very good example, but keep going. Here we so have. There you can see the different folk names of Beaver View. And yeah, so, so the quotography, I guess, allows me to bring together different layers um, of information about the plants. So my... Um, at the moment, I'm working on uh, a structure that that deals. I'm interested in this idea of a dictionary, but I, I didn't quite want it to be a dictionary 
I also just discovered that Karen, who's in the audience tonight, is actually doing a plant dictionary. I didn't realize it was a dictionary um, that she was doing, but I saw it online the other day. So I think this idea is sort of circulating in the ether, you know, this, mm -hmm. this kind of, it's a way to bring forward, because photography is so slippery, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a medium of surfaces. And for me, bringing quotography, research, writing, you know, in, into the, into the realm of the images allows me to create context that, you know, I, I want to be putting my photographs out there, I guess, with a kind of shroud of context around them. Um, and people, you know, there's, there's no rules about how you read the photographs. People can have a very sort of surface uh, engagement with the image and just enjoy it perfectly, you know, for, for how it looks, or they can do a deep dive into the research and the printed matter that goes with the show and um, other materials that might be available. And I know um, that you have um, some video documentation from the 2019 um, exhibition. Um, we were talking about these, obviously these collaborations with writers and then also uh, performative aspects, which obviously is, a, is another way of expanding the work. Would you like me to play that video piece? Yeah, that's, well, that would be great. So performance is another way that I have um, brought forward the research materials and tried to expose those to a viewer. So this is Sasha. <laughs> Emilio N. and Baby Kurtz, 1995. The Philippian Connection, Visalator. Cultural bias and societal hubris have long clouded the vision of scholars, rendering most unwilling to even consider, never mind acknowledge, that ancient cultures possessed the means and the knowledge to do what until very recently was beyond the capabilities of modern medicine. As a result, for centuries, scholars dismissed ancient accounts of certain plants that provided an effective means of birth control. It is widely accepted that information regarding birth control was orally transmitted. And therefore, as a consequence of the persecution of witches, who are often female midwives, herbalists, and healers, much of this information was lost. Marion, a leading naturalist, was bold to travel to Suriname, then a Dutch colony, in 1699, at the age of 52, in search of exotic plants and insects. Mary was one of the few, and perhaps the only European woman, who voyaged exclusively in search of her science in the 17th or 18th century. Shai Bihir Wanda L, 2004. Plants and an Empire. Marion's peacock flower, Poinciana Oshriba, is not a her old plant, a historical statue. Much used in the 18th century as a laxative, nonetheless, it was a highly political plant. Deployed in the struggle against slavery throughout the 18th century by slave women, editor's notes, and slave women, who used it to abort offspring who would otherwise be born into bondage. The Cabaret of Plants, London Profile Books, page 145. As well as the medicinal culture of its indigenous peoples, the American East Coast was a repository for old world plant mythology and folklore. In the redoubt of Appalachian Mountains, especially herbal nostrums, Folk recipes, 
fundamentalist beliefs and outright plant magic had been packed as cultural baggage with the cows and cooking pots by early and survived intact in isolated mountain communities well into the 20th century. Dangerous garden. In its relationship with human beings, the plant kingdom has always locked itself closely to our virtues and our vices. There is therefore no reason to believe that future developments and the interaction between man and plants will be all beneficent. Man's future with plants, like the past, will be filled with contradictions and threats. Plants, whether from rainforest, step, backyard, or the hands of genetic engineers, will continue to produce commodities we have never treated them. New trade routes, new wealth, and no doubt, great dangers too. So, would you like to just um, talk really uh, briefly about how, it, you know, working, this is an international show for you, and, you know, and you're working with performers in a gallery space that, you know, so you have been planning all the way over in New Zealand, and then connecting all of these things, scripting, like, you know, how, how, how that, how that process, you know, sort of informs the exhibition as a whole, or, you know, develops your practice. Yeah, well, you can see in front of you there, Victoria and the audience, um, the collection of quotes that I assembled. Um, so they track back to um, where plants are being traded in a Roman market and forward to um, the manipulation of Google results around, you know, where can I get a, an abortion? And the, the quotography was different for the American uh, performance. Then and the performance in Aotearoa, New Zealand, was was a different narrative that finished around the quote quotations were more around um, the status of abortion, which was then still part of the Crimes Act in New Zealand. So, um, yeah, I uh, that that then became the kind of script for the performance. Um, obviously, it was incredibly stressful uh, trying to plan a performance on the other side of the world. Uh, but I was extremely um, lucky with Sasha. We did rehearsals uh, beforehand. And um, and then our time together in New York when we did intense re rehearsals before the performances um, was really productive. And, you know, she's just such an incredible um, professional and her memory was incredible. She's actually holding little cue cards in case she, um, you know, needed to use them but she never did you know and this is quite dense material and she was able to um to narrate it it's quite phenomenal absolutely yeah, so lots of planning trying to you know mitigate any risks and then but as always a certain degree of um well you just have to be on the ground and do it in the end so that performance was called The Physical Garden, which, of course, is a reference to the, the first sort of uh, medical gardens in the West, which were called um, Physique Gardens. And this is an illustration by um, Maria Sibliathneran, who Sasha referred to in the performance, who's a, a, a naturalist who studied and um, drew plants and insects all her life and travelled to Suriname um, in the late 1600s. And she um, brought back knowledge of Petiveria as a abortifacient plant, which had kind of been, you know, shall we say, sublimated by Western botanists who who um, brought that plant into the the kind of botanical canon. 
I think also, you know, when you're talking about these, uh, the research around these sort of plant histories and things like that, one of the really interesting conversations you and I had about a year ago, um, and you kind of sent me with a reading list, um, was uh, around this kind of history and fascination um, that is relatively recent in a way um, of the house plant. And, you know, Austin was living in this era where she, you know, she filled her house with plants. She was obviously incredibly enmeshed with her own garden um, and designing that her entire family was. Um, but this kind of history of plant keeping in a way and decorating with plants, um, yeah. which I think is a really interesting crossover uh, with your work because your work has all this these layers of meaning but it's also incredibly beautiful um so uh, are you still um I know you are thinking about that um this kind of um westernized uh, uh approach to decorating with plants or um those kind of elements um are they yeah, I yeah, they definitely are. I mean, we're really interested in the history of floristry and, you know, the first plants, um, as I was telling you the other day when we were at Alice Austin House, the first plants that came into the home, and in this case it was a stately home in Britain, they came into the fireplaces and, you know, they had large auxiliary buildings where they made arrangements and they'd carry them on these specially made carts up to the house and put them in all the fireplaces and then gradually the Victorians became more and more obsessed with plants. And, you know, obviously Alice, Alice had definitely caught that bug as well. And, you know, they, um, you know, Alice even had parties for her night bloom, you know. That's so, right. Um, so I think, yeah, the, the history of, of um, indoor plants, the history of floral art, all those things, they're, they're all incredibly interesting and they all have these uh, gendered resonances too. And I think, you know, the, the thing about the witch as the figure in, in the new work, I'm an old phenomenon, is that she really brings these things together. You know, there's this coalescing of, um, you know, this, this revival of knowledge, which, you know, you rightly pointed out is just happening everywhere. So many artists are interested in this moment of revival and, trying to reassemble um, plant knowledge and, and build back that connection to the earth. Um, and, and, the, and there's also this um, sense of the history of floral art, you know, even though, you know, those first arrangements were, were, were invariably made by men, you know, this floral art became the realm of wom of woman's practice, you know, and I'm interested in that too and interested in how floral art was part of the domestic space, you know, before women emerged from that domestic space. Um, pe people like Julia Margaret Cameron and Bertha Morisot, et cetera, they all painted in their gardens, they photographed in their gardens, they, they photographed their children and their friends in their gardens, you know, these were really incredible sites of agency um, for them. And so I love, you know, I love that about Alice Austin House as well. Yes, because I often talk about the garden as safe space. Yeah. Uh, because gardening was an acceptable activity for women and Alice was so clever at creating these you know, clubs that would allow her and her woman friends to be free of the shackles of men. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, you have this queer history going on in the garden that's really rich, um, that can't possibly be separated from women's history and women's experience. Um, and, you know, speaking of the domestic, so this is an image from one of your books, and, and yeah. this is a, a an image that is a space that is a living space. Can you tell us about it? Yeah, so this, I mean, this has a really interest, this house has a really interesting connection with American discourse around women and the role of women in the construction, uh, in the kind of um, 
experimental and innovative aspects of modernism. Um, if you go back just to the cover of it. Abigail, was it? Oh, sorry. It's, I don't know um, if I have the cover of it. Oh, okay. That's all right. Maybe go forward. It might be. I think it's there. Oh, here we are. Yeah. So it's 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 actually it's a book about the house that I live in, but as I came to know the house, just all these things happened, and you know there were all these stories sort of circulating about the house. We were told that the woman who built it was the first single woman in Wellington and possibly in New Zealand to have a mortgage without a male guarantor. And this is the mortgage on screen now, which it took me three weeks to find in New Zealand's National Archives. Um, and so I wanted to make this book that kind of, you know, she's a trailblazer, you know, she's she's your Alice Austin in, a, in another time and place. And um, this is her, Nancy Martin was her name. And um, yeah, she was apparently the first single woman to have a mortgage. And apparently she just strolled into the bank and told them that she's got a good job and give her a mortgage, you know, and she wasn't going to take no for an answer. And I know women now who have had trouble getting mortgages uh, as single women. So, you know, in thinking about Nancy, you know, I was, um, you know, reminded of these, you know, these homes in America where women have also um, played a key role in, in, in their innovation um, and, and format, particularly uh, if you go to the next slide, I do believe the um, Farnsworth House. Um, and these, I'd, I'd read this book, Woman in the Making of the Modern House, which is a fantastic book, um, if anyone's interested in this area, which sort of talk, talks about how women changed the home and they changed it from being a domestic space. These single women, mo, mo, they were mostly single professional women, um, they changed the space, you know, they, they, instead of it, the house being about this idea of family and, you know, um, the entertainment was more important and the spaces privileged, uh, rooms for entertainment as, in, as indeed is the case with this house. Um, so I did a book about the house and then I also staged a performance there, which you just saw an image of, um, where, Again, Pip wrote a story for me that sort of uh, explicated the narrative of the house in really interesting ways. I wanted her to be like the ghost of Nancy, almost like a ghost writer kind of inhabiting the space. And then um, we'll just play a tiny little bit of the audio. Um, um, I'll go back to, that, to, the, um, to the audio slide, Anne. Is that one the one to do for this that has the little sound? Um, yeah, like that one. Yeah, you just it just started to play. Just play a little bit of it because obviously we haven't got enough time to. Yeah, her so scroll, this is her own. Graham didn't understand. She could still see them when he posted them like this. They were with her mother-in-law at a playground. Amanda was getting too old for playgrounds, and she wore a scowl. Davy was jumping around. Graham's mother had never liked Amanda, and Abigail knew now she'd be wearing all of it. Abigail kept going. Cats, dogs, food. People generally looked happy. No one seemed to have missed her. Then a photo of a boat, a large ferry with people crushed in, falling off the side, off the wharf. Crush. These aren't Syrians, the caption read. They are Europeans trying to get to North Africa during the World War. So next time you think... So the house was yeah. designed by a um, Jewish immigrant architect and I wanted to talk about the role of refugees in New Zealand and the contributions that they've made um, and what I did was uh, I completely emptied out the house apart from the art because Nancy was an art collector and um, and it invited groupings of people through and this um, Nancy was also a musician and so the the voice that you just heard after the people entered the house um, after a few minutes of standing around, this voice started telling this story. So you can go online and listen to it. If you're yeah, I think it's a, a beautiful piece and, you know, a, a massive kind of uh, inst the integration of your own home into the work. And um, yeah. it's interesting hearing you talk about Nancy and, you know, achieving this uh, mortgage in it's interesting in terms of even our home, uh, they were very clever because Victor married, married Victorian woman didn't 
own property really and they transferred the ownership of the Alice of the home into Alice's grandmother's name and then willed it to Alice so that it the the ownership would be held by a woman and of course Alice never married so it was not challenged um but the struggle and the work around trying to maintain ownership um, or have independent ownership as a woman is huge. Well, yeah. Do you want to just go that back? We're nearly at 10 minutes out. Can um, you just go back to the previous slide, please, Victoria? And this then, one? Yeah, if people want to sign up to my newsletter, they can. <laughs> There's a QR code there. Oh, and there I, I, I really recommend it. Uh, I mean, the the breadth of of Anne's work is huge and we could have talked about several other bodies of work that are incredibly beautiful but they require talks um all on their own I'm just going to give us uh one more minute for anyone take a screenshot um with your phone use the QR code and then I'm going to sh stop sharing this video so I can kind of bring everyone back together and um so I'm going to do a stop sharing here. Now, I don't currently have any questions in the chat, but usually when we're sort of 10 minutes prior to the end of the talk, I really encourage people to turn on their video if they like, if they'd like to ask a question with their real voice or pop it in the chat at this time, that would be um, phenomenal. Um, and I'm just going to keep talking to Anne while I wait for that to happen. Anyone, please raise your hand. If I haven't seen you, I'm just checking through here. Um, please Thanks pop it in the chat. Coming. Thanks to everyone for coming along. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so as I said, just to keep it in mind that the show will open in March of 2025 four sorry no we've got 2023 so many exhibitions and and one of the things um that we try to do um at the Alice Austin house is to have the opportunity to give artists artists a window of a few years to work with us so that um we can hopefully create a space for them uh, to support them in their work um and a chance to really develop different ideas because it is very different than perhaps showing in a dealer gallery or a really you know huge museum um so there's this kind of opportunity to have a lot of agency um do you think this kind of idea of creating this show for the house um changes your work at all Anne? I think it's going to give me a lot of opportunities to do some things I've wanted to try. And I should point out too that um, the series is ongoing because obviously the the flat, the plants used um, in in green medicine or by witches is just a profound amount of them. So um, so the project will keep keep going. So the images that are shown at Alice Austin, there'll be some new ones shown there as well possibly mostly new ones but you know we'll see how things go but there's also going to be the opportunity to build um some plant sculptures which I'm really interested in because I know that Alice was obsessed with indoor plants and you know had whole areas of them in the house and so I'm interested in trying to dialogue somehow with that um and that's going to be a lot of fun so I'll actually that'll be the first time I bought some plant physical plant elements into the uh into the fold as it were of the exhibition yeah I think there's uh, there's so many elements that I in just in talking to you tonight and scrolling back and forth through your work and then I'm thinking about the you know the elements of the entry points of ceramics into the work the dark matter works and Alice's huge collection of um yeah. you know Chinese vases and these other ornamental elements that really stacked the house and you know I kind of feel like knowing you a little personally as well that you're a collector 
of yeah. sorts. Um, you know, these 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 objects that are kind of really captivating to us. Um, how did you select those vases that you used as sort of some of that those base points for those photographs? I guess conceptually the register I was thinking about for the Jane Says works, which are about abortive ascents and amenagogues and the woman's herbs, as it were, that I was wanting to talk about control and the way those plants could exert control over the body. So that's why I was referencing some of the tools and techniques that you might learn if you learned Ikebana, because there's a lot of folding or um, crimping and uh peering back of plants like taking all the leaves off so you can really see the stem in a different way and I found there was a um a kind of conceptual um resonance there um for this this kind of I, this control over the plant but also the plant's control over a female body or a reproductive body um and I guess the pots are part of that because they're all Ikebana pots. And I basically, I just collected them over years. And I did have at one stage this lovely older gentleman that I found and he would kind of bring out about five pots a week and I'd kind of go and see him most weekends because his wife had passed away. But he was slowly selling her Ikebana pots and she'd practiced Ikebana all her life. Um but he would never let me sort of see the whole lot. It was always just like a little trickle. He wanted so to keep you coming back. <laughs> yeah. I got to his place every weekend, which was about half an hour from my home. And I get to have a look and choose from maybe 10 pots and I'd go away with five, you know, and he had the most amazing collection. But sadly, when I went back, he'd had a fall one day. And so I think he was moved into a home and, you know, he was really my, mo my, my main supplier of amazing Japanese ceramics. No, I think I also, it's so also, interesting to sort of know that. I also got a lot off Trade Me, which is our version right. of it. Yeah. Right. So, Crazy. you know, uh, gathering and harvesting from all sources. Um, yeah. I have one last question, which is a little bit more about the format of the works. So, these sort of um, series that run through like Jane Sears and I Am an Old Phenomenon, they're quite large scale works. And I know obviously you, uh, a lot of your previous works have also been quite large in scale. Um, I think it's going to be quite interesting bringing that kind of scale to the small, low ceilinged rooms of the house and how they will sort of resonate in that space just in terms of the weight of their presence um, with the scale you know how important is it for you to work at that kind of exploded size yeah I think it's really critically important because you know I'm trying I guess I'm trying to get um a more embodied sense of you know this the scale of the work there's a lot to discover in it when it's that scale um you know for instance you can't you can't look at it on a screen or in a book and have that same experience because the images open up so much when you're physically next to them so I think it's important that they've got some kind of bodily scale and things like you know I was talking to someone at my exhibition that opened last night and they were saying they'd only just discovered the insects in the images. So, and some of the images have got insects in them that are kind of a, a nod to uh, Maria Sibylla Mirren, who, you know, paint, we were talking about before, who painted insects. So whenever I found a slug or a little beetle, you know, I would leave it there. But of course, you don't see those when you um, look at the images online or in a book. They only yeah, really... I, I think that that's right. And, you know, we even um you know uh Denny Dimon gallery has been so generous to you know have transported an image of yours over to our galleries just so we could even get a feel for yeah how many how, how many images we could possibly include in this show and I you know I just think that um it's going to be so interesting how this evolves I think it's particularly 
getting really exciting now that you've been to the house and yeah. sort of see the breadth of opportunity for even sort of slightly more um, what we might look at as interventions in the space as well when you were talking about the potential of a fireplace or you know the historical significance of some of these kind of things so what what we will do um the Alice Austin house over the next you know year and and some basically a year and a half is be keeping you all updated with images on our social media we'll definitely um do some newsletter updates about um this, uh, you know, what is a solo show, but is a collaborative process, um, you know, as, as things evolve more. And just thank you so much on your incredibly busy week. And uh, it's, um, what is it? It's the Auckland Art Festival this week. It's the um, Art Fair. Yeah. Aotearoa Art Fair, yeah. So a lot going on, as well as another exhibition opening, all within the space of a month. We're still in November, and your exhibition just opened on November 4th uh, at Denny Dimmons. So uh, very busy time. Very important. Do pop along to Tribeca. Yes. This Bernard Street and see the show. The prints are just so different in reality. You know, they really suck you in. It's like they, they kind of suck up light because they're so sort of dense and I just recently started using a new paper which is much more sustainable it's, it's made out of bamboo and it's a really beautiful surface as well yeah I think it's a it's an amazing show and definitely um please do try to get to it because as Anne says um there's nothing like the experience of the in-person um, and speaking of, we're not in person, um, and I'm going to let you go. And thank you so much, everyone, for listening tonight. And I hope that you really enjoyed this. Thank you, Anne, for putting together all of those um, beautiful visuals. Um, and yeah, I'm just excited to move forward with this process. Thank you. So take care, everyone. And we will see you all soon. Thank you, everyone.